very clear thumbs up to start. So thank you all for uh, inviting me to be here. It's really, uh, really great to, to be a guest. Uh, and that was a great uh, introduction, actually, to follow from there, I have to say. Hit some of the main points that I sort of wanted to start with, uh, that um, you know, we're in a really critical moment here with solar. I've been in the solar field now for a little bit over a decade, and I've seen some massive transporta uh, transformations in that short period of time. And this is a really exciting moment. And one of the, the expressions that uh, Professor Appleton uh, said that fits with solar is that it's really a matter of, of lots of small choices uh, in aggregate overcoming institutional resistance. And I think solar is designed by its very nature to actually do that as a distributed energy technology. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that momentous change in solar can touch down in New York City and what we're trying to do as a program to make that happen in certain areas where there's barriers. But before I do that, I want to give you a little bit more context about why this is such a uh, such an interesting moment and a hopeful moment, I think, for solar. And it's not just people like me or Professor Appleton that are saying that. This is actually a, a quote taken from a paper by the Edison Electric Institute, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, that's pretty much the indus industry group uh, for investor-owned utilities. Um, and if you basically summarize this to saying, oh, wow, solar's getting really cheap really quick. What are we going to do about it? That's more or less a paraphrase of what this, uh, what this says. And they use this, this word and this term disruptive, which gets used quite a bit, a bit uh, overused. But I think solar technology, distributed solar technology, is the definition of a disruptive uh, energy source. And what does that mean uh, exactly? Um, disruptive is not just something that grows and succeeds, but it's something that does that at the expense of the status quo. So it makes things different. Um, it challenges uh, existing institutions and regimes. And sometimes it does that really, really quick. That's the definition of disruptive. And if you look at rooftop solar, which is what we focus on, this seems to be visually, at least, the opposite of disruptive. It's almost conspicuously boring uh, physically. Uh, it just sort of sits there. It has no moving parts. But the great paradox of solar is that therein lies its power, is the fact that, that solar is Power. We, we a lot of times have this equivalency between different renewables, that they're renewable and they're low carbon. And that gives a sense that they're all sort of the same. Um, but some of the things about solar that, that distinguish it a bit is that it's based on and powered by something that we take for granted, obviously, is the rising in the sun uh, every day. That's its power source. But the fact that it has no moving parts uh, means that it lasts a really, really long time. But it can also be integrated with all kinds of other objects, from your calculator to a house uh, to a solar farm, uh, et cetera. So it can, as a result of that, can really spread out all over the place. So that means that lots of different types of people in different types of places can have access to it and, and want it. And that's really the key to its, its disruptiveness, is the fact that it can be distributed and owned by people and by organizations uh, and giving them autonomy from the existing system. So in that sense, small, again, to echo what Professor Appleton said, it's these lots of cumulative uh, choices in aggregate that can be actually quite, quite big. And think about how different that is from our existing system, not just that it's zero carbon and renewable, but our relationship to it. Um, how we get electricity now is from a centralized infrastructure that we have no influence uh, over uh, how that's uh, developed or how that works beyond paying an electricity bill. And this is the conventional arrangement that you have generators that provide electricity to customers. And that's exactly what we are. And what's disruptive about solar is actually quite simple. The more solar that's there out on the grid producing electricity, the less electricity that's actually being produced from centralized power generators. So that's very disruptive. It's a different type of relationship that we have with our electricity. And then if you add other things, I'm sure most people, a lot of people in this room saw the video that Elon Musk put out about the launch of the, the Tesla battery and have seen some of the debate about that. But this is another thing that adds a level of disruption that is, is uh, an order of magnitude different. Uh, the ability to really almost hold hostage to the existing model about saying that the, the possibility of, of grid defection uh, or of really massive uh, removal from the grid. Um, not, not a crazy science fiction idea anymore. And this thing, again, is a definition of disruption, can happen really, really fast. And that's the thing that's amazing about solar. It's essentially a, a product. 
And if the conditions are right, it can be adopted. And it can be adopted like a fire that spreads in certain areas. Now, because it can spread doesn't mean it won't spread. So what's happening right now that is making this growth occur so quickly? What is this, this confluence of forces um, that's referred to in this passage here? Just to summarize real quickly, one is we've seen the cost, the equipment cost of solar, the real cost of it, come down dramatically in a really short period of time. So since 2011, about an 80% reduction in uh, PV uh, cost. Um, and a lot of the reason why that's happened is because really Germany essentially adopted a very aggressive renewable energy policy that many of you read about. But the consequence was is that really activated China's productive capacity and it reached a scale that drove the cost of solar down really dr dramatically, even in the, the period of time that I've worked. So solar is a lot cheaper now on the equipment side. As you can see some of the headlines here. The other piece of this is that there's a policies have evolved that have made, that have enabled uh, renewable energy. So the very fact that the cost came down as a result of a feed-in tariff policy that Germany put in place, but many other places as well, in Japan, California, parts of the United States, have adopted policies that have, that have created a lot of demand, um, that have compensated solar for being a, a, a low carbon or no carbon uh, technology, so tax credits and things like that, and that have just plain enabled people to be able to connect to the grid, to actually have solar legally. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress on that front. And then the third piece here is financing. So it used to be with solar that you had, it was a capital cost essentially. You had to buy a big a system up front and then wait over time in order to be able to, to make your money back on that. Um, so it was a long, you had to have a lot of cash up front. Uh, banks were unfamiliar with the technology, not willing to lend. But we've had really in the last few years, the real revolution in solar is now a variety of financing options to turn up what's a capital cost up front essentially into an operating cost. So you can pay your monthly loan service on or a lease uh, for solar at a rate that's lower than what you'd be paying for electricity. So solar on a month by month basis now can beat, uh, beat um, uh, uh, interconnectivity to the grid, or rather um, uh, conventional um, fossil fuels. Now how does all this sort of play out in New York City, the, the country's biggest, um, biggest city? And it's an interesting question for us because we're all New Yorkers, but one thing to just to put in your head is that when you look at the history of solar, where I started in solar, I'm a New Yorker, but I, I moved out to California to get involved in it. And this was this sort of birthplace of where the off the gridders after, you know, in the 70s sort of first brought solar down to the ground basically from the space program and started using it. And then other places around the world have had these chapters that have pushed forward solar, whether it's Germany or Japan. And with each of their local efforts, uh, we've all benefited from that. It's changed solar. It's either changed the technology or the pricing of solar. So for me, it's an interesting question of not only how are we here in New York going to get more solar, but how are we as New Yorkers going to have our role? Or what's the chapter that New Yorkers will play in changing solar so that the rest of the country or the world actually can enjoy it in, in a greater access? So what we're really excited about here in New York, a lot of people sort of fixate on with solar about how much sun do you have? And you know, I mentioned Germany before, which has the average sunlight of around Anchorage, but yet they've been able to be uh, a major producer and, and transformative force in solar. We got plenty of sun, but the thing that really, the straw that really stirs the drink with, with, with rooftop solar is what do you pay for electricity? And we all know that New Yorkers pay a lot for electricity. We pay more than double uh, what the national average is. It's among the highest retail rates. When the pastor mentioned Hawaii, uh, it's not a coincidence that Hawaii uh, is, is really forcing a crisis essentially on that island. It's because they pay about 34 to 40 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. So we're really in the 48 states kind of right behind them actually. So this is a place that's fertile, I think, for, for solar uh, development. And we've already started to see it in what some people might think are the most unlikely of places here. Some of you might not know that Staten Island, of all the boroughs, has probably seen, and Jeff maybe could even confirm this for me because he looks at the numbers a lot closer there than I do. I would bet that Staten Island, the level of residential solar in Staten Island that's happened in the last year is probably the fastest growth of any county in the history of solar in the United States. Okay, All these green tree-hugging Staten Islanders are you know, pushing their green agenda on the rest of the city. Um, but what that says is where, where, how solar has matured. It's become something that's actually quite mainstream if the conditions are correct. Now, what about the rest of New York? 
We focus specifically on, really on residential right now. Um, affordable housing, co-ops and condos and one to four family homes, which I'll get into in a second. Really high potential in New York for the reason I just said, high electricity costs, so the incentive to generate your own electricity and get credit for your own solar electricity is actually quite high. Sorry about the Brooklyn picture here instead of the picture of Statue of Liberty, that's my own borough bias. Very high potential, but also still a lot of high barriers, particularly if you look at different segments, the ones that I just mentioned. So what we look at as our job is that we're trying to actually intervene in some of those segments of the residential market that face specific challenges. How can we actually intervene to remove some of those challenges? So I want to just give you a quick overview of what those are. As I said, we focus on small homes, particularly row houses with flat roofs. I'll explain why, they're, why they have challenges in a second. Co-ops and condos and then affordable housing uh, as well. Um, again, high barrier but high potential. So let me go over what the, our, our row house program, which is actually the one that we put a lot. It's a, it's a program that just started a little bit under a year ago, and this is the one we've been putting a lot of our, our time and effort into. What we do with, with these types of homes, in many ways, they're kind of ideal for solar, that they have flat roofs, which means that they can face their panels to the south. They're often over the tree line. You'd think that that would be actually uh, kind of a market that a lot of solar installers would be fighting over. But the fact of the matter is, here in New York, to get any kind of construction project done is a bit of a hassle. If anybody is a homeowner or has been involved in anything uh, like that, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of permitting, a lot of red tape to move through. So for a solar installer, which are often relatively small businesses, when they look at that process here in New York, they see a pretty small return relative to the level of effort that they have to put into a project. Because solar installers don't just get a bunch of equipment and then go put it on your roof. They actually do a whole bunch of other things as well, which often they don't um, make completely clear to their, their customers. They have to spend the money to get the customer in the first place, the customer acquisition. They have to do the design and engineering. The permitting and inspections is probably what drives solar installers most insane, actually, in this city. The number of permits that they have to get, inspections, and then they get rejected for sometimes arbitrary reasons and do it over again. And every time they have to be at the house and they get parking tickets, all of these things actually really, really add up. And then they get to the installation. So again, with these small roofs that have relatively small systems, the majority of solar installers opt out. A lot of people who own those homes might call up an installer and never get a call back, or they'll get a really, really high quote that's designed to, to uh, compensate for that. So our strategy here is what we call group solar. Okay, so the idea is, is how do you make these little marginal properties actually attractive to installers rather than unattractive to installers? And we sort of follow the model of the school of fish. So fishes have evolved to form schools for many reasons. And one of them is that a bunch of little fish get together, they look like a big fish and they scare away a predator. So we want our little projects to look like a big fish, but rather than scaring away a solar installer, we want to lure them in uh, through that process. Another thing that a school does, which is mesmerizing if you look at it, uh, in, you know, if you're scuba diving or on a video, is the ability to coordinate, to basically act as one body. They give the impression that they're one thing. And that's what we try to do as well. How do you get these multiple homeowners to coordinate uh, with each other so that they appear to be one transaction for the installer. And then the third thing, obviously, is proximity. All of these fish are close together. That's what creates the illusion of them being one body. So we looked at aggregating homes that are all in the same neighborhood and then helping them solicit proposals from an installer. And I'll explain how that model works real quick. The first thing we have to do, we take on is that we actually do all the education. If someone's interested in doing solar, they'll have a million questions here in New York that could range to, can I do it? Is my roof right? What does this do to my property values? Is it gonna burst into flames? We get all sorts of questions. And so it's our job to get that person to a yes, okay, uh, before, um, before they move forward. Now, yes isn't enough, because while there are a lot of roofs that can do solar here in New York, there are a lot that can't. And this is what frustrates a lot of installers to have to invest the time to uh, determine whether or not someone's a viable project. We go and do that, actually. We'll go to a home, uh, we'll first do a satellite assessment, we'll go to a home in groups. Usually we get a group of people on a Saturday, we'll do one right after another in the same neighborhood. And we get the electricity bills. We do a measurements of the roof. Uh, we, we package together all this information that an installer would normally have to collect at their own cost. And then we also do 
pictures of the roof while we're up there and videos of the roof and the electrical service. So we get enough information where a solar installer could basically know if this is a viable customer and what size system they could put on the roof and they never have to leave their computer. Okay, so that's one huge value add that we add. And then it's about group formation. How do we get these people together? We work with groups of about three to 10 homeowners that all live in the same area. Three is sort of a minimum size, 10 is a maximum size, because they ultimately have to come to a consensus on which installer they want to pick. This can happen in many ways. We already, with our limited number of groups, it may be that people come in through a survey that we have on our website, and we see on our map that we can connect this person to this person, and we form the group. Or you might have it where three neighbors heard about it, and they come together, and they're already a group. It can happen in a number of ways. It can happen me speaking at an event like this, and maybe a, a group sort of forms through that as well. So once a group is formed, they get a profile on our website, herecomesolar.com, and now it's the time for them to select an installer. And what we do, feedback we get from, let me know if I'm running over, by the way. Uh, I lose track of time when up here. Um, what we do is we realize that people want options for solar installers, but they don't know how to define those options, and they don't want a million options. So what we've done is we've pre-qualified a small group of installers that we've done the due diligence on. We've gone and checked the reference checks. We have is a certain minimum level of local experience because it's, you have to have done jobs here in New York in order to do jobs here in New York. And we don't want people learning on the job about how they get through the DOB, how they get through Con Ed. So we select a group of locally experienced installers that have the ability to bid on projects. So when we form a group, let's say it's five homeowners, like our, our first group that we had in Gowanus, they, have to come to a unanimous decision on which installer they're going to pick. The installer will submit a standard proposal that we've created for them, and they give a group rate for everybody. But because they got all this information on customers, if there's certain special costs that may pop up because of their building, they'll add that into the proposal. And what the group has to do is they have to come to a decision on which they're gonna pick. So it's winner take all. That's what's attractive to the installer. They're not gonna get two and then another installer will get three. They get the whole group. What we do is we create this neat little portal that makes it easy for the installer as though they're interacting with a single customer. So this is, this is actually a screenshot from our website of one of the groups, the group that just two days ago decided on an installer in Lefferts Gardens in Brooklyn. And an installer that's registered would be able to come here, they would click on that opportunity notice uh, tab there, which is a little two-page RFP that says what the selection criteria is, who the people are. They could look at this information here that says when their deadline is for submitting a proposal and when the group is going to make a decision. It's all very predictable. And then what they can do is they can click on every single person here and look at their detailed report. So they can get real information on the customers. And based on that totality of specific information, they come up with a proposal and they submit it, upload it just to our website. It's that easy. This is a picture of what we call sunblock. This is when we have a new group, we boom, post it up there, and our qualified installers are notified. They can come, click on that, and take a look. So what's the result of that? The groups get together, and they make a decision. And we've done a few of these now, and it's been a great experience. Uh, the one thing that this was designed to do was to give discounts, to make projects happen in the first place, but to also give discounted pricing. And these are the mechanisms for discounted pricing if you look at it through the eyes of it, a solar installer. Well, these are customers that are project ready, that are educated, and I can look at these reports and say, they're ready. Okay, so they have to don't, there's no sales process, essentially. There's multiple customers through one solicitation process. So it's not five customers asking for references and calling them up. It's coming through a single pinhole that they're, they're interacting with almost like a single customer. And the, the, the process is predictable and rapid. It's a month. We post it, you have two weeks to put a, a proposal in, and then, the group has two weeks to make a decision. And every group member that we have is already um, signs an agreement that they're going to go with the group. It's an actual contract that they sign in order to be a participant. And what's been great about this is the second layer is that because we have multiple installers, there's competition there that actually drives down the uh, a little bit more. They know that other people are putting proposals in. So they'll actually push the price down. And what I'm really excited about, as I said in the beginning, is that many installers opt out of this market altogether. But when we have a school of fish approach, 
you get other installers that are suddenly interested in these types of properties. And those installers are often bigger installers that happen right, at a larger scale and can bring a lower price because they procure equipment at a lower, lower volume. So now the benefit of that scale is no longer just for big business properties. It's now for these little rinky-dink ones because they've been able to form a group. And what we've seen in the groups that we've done on average, because we're able to compare it to state data of, of systems that were installed over the last 12 months in the same area using the same equipment, a 20% discount for people's pricing. These are the, the lowest cost solar and system systems that are gonna be installed in this area. But there's another thing that goes along with it too that's not just about price. It has to do about the dynamics of groups. This is a new technology here in New York and we know from any technology, there's a robust literature, any innovative technology, the thing that drives adoption most is not what are the facts, What's the math? What's the spreadsheet? It's, is somebody else like me also doing this? So what we do is we create this context, this intimate circle of people basically, that are able to talk themselves through this process. They're able to ask questions to each other. Uh, who do you want? Why do you want it? Why are you doing it? And we think that that builds a lot of trust and knowledge. It also builds power as well. Because here's the, the picture of our first signing back in November, the prospect Gowanus neighbors, uh, we called them. Uh, they picked a, a, an installer based in the Bronx. And they have each other throughout this whole process. They're connected to each other. So if Adel right there, who's a bit of a genius who gave me information about solar that I didn't even have, which I love about the group thing, um, he can talk to Anne about, well, where are you in the process? Are they not calling you back? So they get leverage versus the installer, which I think gives people a lot of, of confidence. And the other thing is too is, once they're done with their installations, every subsequent group that comes can connect with any other member of Here Comes Solar through our website. So if you want to ask somebody about their experience with an installer, if you want to find out how long something took, it's right there. You can look them up on our map. Uh, you can find any other member. Now, very quickly, I'll wrap up. Co-ops and condos, very different strategy. These are not little roofs often. Often these are good roofs that can support pretty big systems. The problem is, is that getting through a co-op board can be an incredibly frustrating experience as somebody who lives in a co-op and, and goes to board meetings. For a solar installer to have to go before a board and say, hey, here's the reason why you want to do it, and then suddenly one person scuttles it because they don't believe in global warming, is not necessarily a rabbit hole that they want to spend their scarce time on. So our goal there, and it's also, it's, it's daunting for the one member of the board who might be like, I'm into this. I'm sure there's people in this room who are those people. Where do you find my information? How do I tell my board that this is actually a good decision? We go in there, we do the same analysis of their building. We, get, we look at all of their electricity bills. We can connect them with other, again, peer-to-peer, -peer, other co-ops that have done this, and we'll bring them into a board meeting. So we basically coach and support co-op champions so that they can actually make a clear, uh, uh, clear case. I will admit, even in spite of this, this is the most difficult area that we work in of the three. Co-ops are very, very challenging. Um, and then the last thing we're working in, and I'll end with this, is affordable housing. Affordable housing, as you know, is not a millionaire's business. <clears throat> These nonprofits that run affordable housing operate on very thin margins. So the ability to save any kind of money from their operating costs can actually make a big deal. And increasingly here in New York, energy costs are a big part of their operating. Now the problem is, is that a lot of the incentives that make solar and, uh, affordable are, are tied to tax credits. And as we know, nonprofit organizations can't take advantage uh, of that. So a way to make it possible for nonprofits is through arrangements where a third party owns the solar system, puts it on their roof, and then sells it to them for a rate that's lower than what they're currently paying. Now, that's great, but typically those types of arrangements for these types of buildings are only available to larger types of roofs where the economics make sense. So what we do is we work with nonprofits and we look across their entire portfolio of buildings, we do all of their assessments, and we package them together, and through that same uh, profile uh, platform, we help them solicit both finance and uh, installation. <clears throat> uh, we're just about to sign for a CDC up in northern Manhattan what's the first solar hot water heating power purchase agreement in all of New York State, maybe in all of the East Coast actually, uh, by doing this, this type of model, which is going to save them from year one 20% on their hot water heating costs, and that will add up over time. So we're really excited about the opportunity to do this uh, over time. So this is our website right here. Uh, in the back I left some flyers. The way it usually starts with us, we have a survey 
that you can click on, give us some information, and then immediately we can start looking at roofs if you're in a co-op or a homeowner or whatever. Uh, I'm gonna, losing my voice as I always do when I talk. I'm gonna have to take off before the, the, the session wraps, unfortunately, um, so I'll also leave some of my cards back on the table. But if any of you are interested in getting involved in any type of way, uh, this will only work uh, through the accumulation of small choices. So thank you very much.